Chapter twenty five of the Expedition of the Donner Party and its Tragic Fate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Donna Stewart, Seattle, Washington. The Expedition of the Donner Party and its Tragic Fate by Eliza P. Donner Houghton. Chapter twenty five fever patients from the mines, unmarked graves, the tales and taunts that wounded my young heart. A short experience in the mines cured Grandpa's mining fever, but increased his rheumatism. The accounts he brought of sufferings he had witnessed in the camps prepared us for the approaching autumn's work, when many of the happy fellows who had started to the gold fields in vigorous health and with great expectations returned haggard, sick, and out of luck. Then was noble work done by the pioneer women. No door was closed against the needy. However small the house might be, its inmates had some comfort to offer the stranger. Many came to Grandma, saying they had places to sleep, but begging that she would give them food and medicine until they should be able to proceed to San Francisco. Weary mortals dragged their aching limbs to the benches under her white oak tree, dropped upon them, with blankets still across their shoulders, declaring they could not go another rod. Often she turned her face aside and murmured, "'God help the poor wanderers!' But to them she would say encouragingly, "'You be not very sick. You will soon be rested. There be straw in the stack that we will bring for your bed, and me and the children.' will not let you go hungry. Ere long, beds had to be made on the floor of the unfinished house. More were needed, and they were spread under the great white oak. On a block beside each fever patient stood a tin cup, which Georgia and I were charged to keep full of cold water, and it was pitiful to see the eyes of the sick watch the cooling stream we poured. Our patients eagerly grasped the cup with unsteady hands, so that part of its contents did not reach the parched lips. Often we heard the fervid prayer, God bless the women of this land, and bless the children too. Soon we learned to detect signs of improvement, and were rejoiced when the convalescents smiled and asked for more to eat. Grandma carried most of the food to them and sent us later for the empty dishes. Of the many who came to us that season, there was but one who never proceeded on his way. He was a young German, fair of face, but terribly wasted by disease. His gentle, boyish manner at once made him a favorite, and we not only gave him our best care, but when a physician drifted into town, Grandma sent for him and followed his directions. I remember well the day that John, seemed almost convalescent, relished his breakfast, wanted to talk a while, and before we left him, had us bring him a basin of warm water and his beflowered carpet-bag, from which he took a change of clothing and his shaving outfit. When we saw him later, his hair was smoothly combed, he looked neat and felt encouraged, and was sure that he should soon be up and doing for himself. At nightfall Grandma bade us wipe the dish as quickly as possible, at which Georgia proposed a race to see whether she could wash fast enough to keep us busy, and we got into a frolicsome mood, which Grandma put an end to with the sobering remark, "'Oh, be not so worldly-minded. John is very bad to-night. I be in a hurry to go back to him, and you must hold the candle.' We passed out into the clear, cold starlight, with the burning candle sheltered by a milk-pan, and picked our way between the lumber to the unfinished room where John lay. I was the last to enter, and saw Grandma hurriedly give the candle to Georgia, drop upon her knees beside the bed, touch his forehead, lift his hand, and call him by name. The damp of death was on his brow. The organs of speech had lost their power. One long upward look, a slight quivering of the muscles of the face, and we were alone with the dead. I was so awed that I could scarcely move, but Grandma wept over him as she prepared his body for burial. 
the next afternoon we three and grandpa and a few friends followed him to his final resting place after he was gone grandma remembered that she did not know his name in full the land of his birth nor the address of his people expecting his recovery she had not troubled him with questions and the few trinkets in his carpet-bag yielded no identifying clue so he lies in a nameless grave like countless other youth of the period we had patients of every type those who were appreciative and grateful and those who rebelled against confinement and swore at the pain which kept sleep from their eyes and hurled their things about regardless of consequences the most trying were the chronic grumblers who did not know what they wanted nor what they ought to have and adopted the moody refrain but the happy times are over i've only grief and pain for i shall never never see susanna dear again the entrance of georgia and myself would occasionally turn their thoughts into homeward channels and make them reminiscent of their little children and loved ones back in the states then again our coming would set them to talking about our early disaster and such horrible recounts of happenings in the snowbound camps that we would rush away and poor georgia would have distressing crying spells over what we had heard at first no tears dimmed my eyes for i felt with keen indignation that those wounding tales were false but there came hours of suffering for me later when an unsympathetic soldier nicknamed picayune butler engaged me in conversation and set me to thinking he was a great big man with eyes piercing as a hawk's and lips so thin that they looked like red lines on his face parting and snapping together as he repeated the horrible things he had read in the california star he insisted that the donner party was responsible for its own misfortune that parents killed their babies and ate their bodies to keep themselves alive cut off the heads of companions and called them good soup bones and were as thievish as sneaking indians even stealing the strings from the snowshoes of those who had come to their rescue he maintained that keseberg had murdered my mother and mutilated my dead father's body and that he himself felt that the miserable wretches brought from starvation were not worth the price it had cost to save them too young too ignorant and too distressed to disprove the accusations or resent his individual view i could only take refuge behind what i had heard and seen in camp and declare i know it is not true they were good people and loved their babies and were sorry for everybody how could i believe his cruel words while i had come from the mountains remembering most clearly the sufferings from cold hunger thirst and pitiful surroundings i had also brought from there a child's mental picture of tenderest sympathies and bravest self-denials evinced by the snowbound in my father's camp and of mrs murphy's earnest effort to soothe and care for us three little sisters after we had been deserted at the lake cabins by katie and stone also her motherly watchfulness over jimmy eddy georgia foster and her own son simon and of mr eddy's constant solicitude for our safety on the journey over the mountains to sutter's fort vain however my efforts to speak in behalf of either the dead or the absent every attempt was met by the steady assertion you can't prove anything you were not old enough to remember or understand what happened oh how i longed to be grown to have opportunities to talk with those of the party who were considered old enough to remember facts and would answer the questions i wanted to ask and how firmly i resolved that when i grew to be a woman i would tell the story of my party so clearly that no one could doubt its truth End of chapter 25 Recorded by Donna Stewart, Seattle, Washington